Okay, and we're back. Once again, we are doing something new. Today, we're going to talk about aircraft carriers. And I'm looking forward to it. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I to, am super I'm, excited. I'm jazzed. I'm pumped. This yeah. is a really interesting topic, so let's get right into it. And I think you you found something really specific you, on some aircraft carriers. And w- which one is that? That would be on the uh, USS Hornet. Um, USS Hornet, there's actually, there's been... Uh, seven different ships named the USS Hornet. Um, they've even either been scrapped or uh, crashed, uh, sunk, etc. And so as they phase one out, they, they give another one the name the USS Hornet. The last two, uh, which the Navy calls CV-8 and CV-12, those mm-hmm. are the two aircraft carriers that, um, that were named the Hornet. And so um, CV-8 was, um, was built... Uh, in the 40s, actually late 30s, and um, it was one of the first aircraft carriers ever. So, first aircraft carriers that had the job of what they do now. Yes, okay. exactly. Thank you for clarifying that. And so, um, they it, this would be instrumental in so many different battles and areas of World War II. But um, CV-8, which um, was USS Hornet, it... Um, it originally started off with a straight runway, basically okay. a flight deck that was yeah. straight. I've seen pictures of them, and they look like they have multiple runways. But yeah, the first one had a straight one runway. Yes, was the, did the U.S. make the first aircraft carrier? Is were we the first ones to make it? That I'm not sure. Um, did was that something that you probably? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know either. I want to say that France and the U.S. were both making them at the same time. Okay, uh, but I, I could be wrong on that. Yeah, still to this day. I believe France is the only country that has two. The other a couple of other countries are in the process of making some, and the U.S. has eleven going on twelve. It's it's, so it's we have more by far by far than, than anybody. anybody else. Yes, and what's amazing about them and and uh, is they're nuclear powered. Almost all of these they're right. nuclear powered, so yeah, they, they have can nuclear reactors. Most of them have two nuclear reactors. Yeah, so they could basically run forever. That's right. Yeah, you know? they they don't have to refuel for. I think 50 years is they, they build them to last 50 years to their, their shelf life. And they, they take them in for like major maintenance after 25, but they do ma- do maintenance on them every time they come into port, which is only once every year, couple years because they don't need to come in very often because they don't have to come in for fuel. They just have to have food replenished. A, yes, a lot. Just basically so the there's food is a, brought out to them. And not only that, they have a ship. So there, there's generally, um, from my understanding, there's four to eight ships that are generally with any aircraft carrier at any given time. Yeah. They, they always have their escorts. But before we get too far into the technical stuff, let's hear more about this Hornet. So, so they rebuild it in the forties. So the, the CV eight is the first, is it, the first rendition. Yes. So CV-8 is the first rendition as an aircraft carrier. And so um, it it participated in in many battles. But one of the most interesting scenarios of it, first of all, you have to imagine you have Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, the absolute devastation that was caused on that Sunday morning. People wake up all across the nation and their hearts are just hurting within them to realize that thousands of Americans and not just thousands of American lives, but all of the armaments and ships and and, and um, planes, et cetera, that, that were sunk or damaged due to this raid on Pearl Harbor. And so immediately, within just a few hours, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave the order that at some point, U.S. forces were to hit mainland Japan. Wow. And so So. he didn't say when he didn't specify when they had to do it, but he specified that he wanted it done sometime in the future. And so they actively began planning. But you got to remember, at that point, they didn't have bombers that could fly across the ocean uh, that is specifically the the Pacific Ocean. They didn't. Yeah, there were several refill points. They had to stop in neutral countries or allied countries to refuel. Exactly. Yeah. So. it was going to be quite the undertaking, and they did not have a bomber with that long of range. And so uh, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle uh, came and said, I think I've come up with a way. I think that we could take a B-25 bomber and stick it on uh, this new 
contraption that we have called an aircraft carrier and we could sail very close to Japan, take off with our with our bombers, which were thought to be too large to take off of a right. of an aircraft yeah. carrier. But we can take off and we can hit mainland um, Japan. And so they they begin they put this plan in action. They actually practiced it for months. Um, and in um, in I believe it was April of 1942. They they secretly they asked several different pilots and, and navigators, would you like to participate in a secret plan? They didn't tell them what the plan was. They just said, would you like to participate in a secret mission? Wow. And 16 planes crews, uh, five people on each crew, they volunteered. And so after training, they put them on this USS Hornet and they started off towards Pearl Harbor. They they wanted it to seem like they were just taking extra planes out to Pearl Harbor, but really right. they were going to rendezvous out there. Oh, wow. So they rendezvous. Make quick long story short, these 16 planes end up taking off their bombers. They end up finding once they're out to sea, they're told what their mission is. And they launch some sort of counterattack, I imagine. They begin to launch the Doolittle Raid. Wow. The Doolittle Raid. But here's the thing. You have to consider these huge bombers. And then, so the USS Hornet at that point was 837 feet long. Okay. But you had 16 bombers on the flight deck that were lashed down, plus all of their normal planes that were underneath. Okay. So it's not like today where they have an elevator that brings them up from the lower hangar. <laughs> but... Um, so all that, the planes on the USS Hornet at this time had to be stored on the flight deck. No, no, no. No. The bombers had, were stored on the flight deck. They had fighter jets and all of that that were stored in the in the hangar below. But they didn't ha- because they didn't have room for the fighters and the bombers, they had to tie the bombers down on top. And um, so they had in the flight hangar below they had all of their normal planes. Then on top, they had these 16 other planes. Here's the reason why they had them is because they knew that once they took off, the mission was they would never return. And they, they, they knew this? They knew this. Oh, my They knew goodness. that they were never going to return back to the USS Hornet. So they only had enough fuel to take off, okay. fly, drop their bombs on Japan, and then they were all going to fly to China and land in China, which was a friendly nation at that oh point. Oh, my goodness. The problem was, was they got into terrible, terrible weather. And as this weather was just pounding them, all of a sudden they noticed a Japanese patrol. Uh, they were um, right at 690 nautical miles from Japan. They their mission was they were going to take off at 400 nautical miles. Okay. So, you know, basically 300 miles before where they were supposed to launch, they see this Japanese patrol boat. So they sink that they hurry up and sink the patrol ship, hoping that they hadn't radioed back to Japan. And then they and immediately the admiral said, take off. So they they go to take off 900 nautical miles, not 300, which was the plan. No, the um, four. It was supposed to be 400 was the plan. Okay. And 690 is where they're at when they take off. They take off, mind you, in this terrible weather and they they launch these 16 uh, flights. But back then they didn't have a catapulter. So they just you had to take off into the wind. Just hoping you would make it. And so the wind was blowing actually into their face. They said that that helped them. The next thing that they were, because the waves were so terrible, they could only launch one when the ship was on the upside of a wave. Yeah. So they had to make sure that they caught the swell right. Mm -hmm. And the first plane that took off was Colonel Doolittle, who was the leader of the raid. He actually... Because of all the planes that were stored on the flight deck, normally you don't have that. Mm-hmm. He only had 400 feet of runway to take off. Oh, because they're 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 taking up fl- the they're runway taking space. up the runway space. Oh my, which goodness. was unusual. But they they um so normally they'd have about 800 feet to of, of runway space. But he had 437 feet. That's all he had. They, um, Long story short, because we could get he into made the, it, right? He got all 16 planes, okay. took off, they all dropped their bombs, and then they all 
crash landed. Every one of them crash landed. Oh, and out of the 80 members of the crew, only 11 lost their lives. So, in fact, going back to that, not those out of those 11, only five actually lost their life on the mission. The others were taken um, captive by the Japanese and died of starvation in, in POW camps. But yeah, so so the USS Hornet played a role in that. It played a role in which they say was the turn of the war in 1942. They said, even though it didn't do much damage in Japan, the USS Hornet at that point played a huge role because it got psychologically into the Japanese minds and they started calling planes back. Well, from yeah, Australia up stuff. until this point, they, this was brand new technology. Here are these bombers. They don't know where they're coming from, or maybe they did know where they're coming from, right? Seemingly out of the middle of the ocean. Yes. And prior to that, nothing has, nothing had been done like that. Yeah. So, um, the, the USS Hornet very quickly, it ended up participating in the battle of Midway, which was the turn of the war. It ended up participating in the battle of Guadalcanal and, um, um, it, it was just it was just amazing. So in October of 1942, it was participating in um, the Battle of Santa Cruz. And while it was there participating, it, it got shot and kamikaze by three, three different planes and two different torpedoes. And it ended up sinking. Um, man. So mind you, at this point, there's 3,300 men okay. on this, on this aircraft carrier. And what's amazing about it is only six lost their lives. What? Only six lost their lives. 3,300 people made it out. Yes. That's so crazy. It is amazing that how the, um, how they, they so just. So I do know they. I don't know if they built them like this back then, but there's several corridors and locking doors and there's all these buffers. So the water has to go through a buffer, fill up that, that buffer and then go to the next buffer. So they sink very slowly. Um, I imagine that must've been the case for this one. Well, yes, actually. So, uh, it, it's, it's an amazing story, but it was shot and kamikaze and different planes are hitting into it and it damaged the electrical system to where it could not control itself it, it, it had no power mm -hmm. and so the admiral said he ordered it to be towed and so they hooked up and they started towing it away to get it kind of out of the battle and they started making repairs on it and in a i believe a nine hour span they had almost completely repaired all of the electrical problems and they were going to stick it back in the battle when eight more kamikazes oh came and began to hit this thing. And so um, it was at a 14 degree list when suddenly the Admiral said abandon ship and they all abandoned, but because it had been towed before and because there was, it was surrounded by destroyers and others that were trying to get it out of the battle. That's why so many men's lives were saved. Well, a couple of the things that you said reminded me of some, some things they still do today for from a fighter pilot's perspective and that's they still fly against the wind and the reason for that is if you say you have a stall speed of 150 miles an hour okay and you have 30 miles per hour of wind blowing towards you mm -hmm. so if you're flying upwind you can now fly moving across the ground 30 miles per hour slower because you have this headwind so your stall speed is is pacified by the by the headwind. Got it. So when you sit, when your boat is moving into a headwind, when your boat is moving, it's creating wind because it's moving against the wind, and plus you have your natural wind, so you're flying against the wind. So you can fly slower. So basically, and not stall. So basically, if I'm hearing you right, an aircraft carrier never launches planes when the aircraft carrier itself is at a standstill. No, they don't launch or land when it's at a standstill. It's always moving. Always moving. And and, and at what speed it, would it be moving? Any idea of that? I don't know what speed it's moving at, but it, there's um, crosswinds and a lot of things they have to calculate against when they go to land. So it really depends on if they can get steady winds. And then if they get steady winds, then it's up to the pilot to be able to keep his no. He has to keep correcting because the, the flight deck, you just talked about straight flight decks, they, start, they change them to have be 10 degrees off. Mm -hmm. So because they're 10 degrees off, they're constantly adjusting to make up for that 10 degrees as they get closer to the aircraft carrier. Got it. And they have to get it perfectly straight on. That's the one thing that the pilot is in control, full control of is keeping the line center. He has to keep that guy 
right on the right on the money. And then the people that radio him help him with the angle of attack, help him with the speed, the rate of descent, and all these other things that are essential to. And and landing. isn't there also a, a series of lights called? Uh, they, I believe they call it fly the ball. And there's like um. Green means you're okay. Right. Yellow well, means you're there's you're light getting that dangerous. can shine from the aircraft carrier, and they have like what's called a heads up display, which is a green line, and they have to make sure that the light is above the green line. If it's below the green line, then something's wrong. And if the light goes red, that means they're way off. And they're gonna so, they're basically gonna face plant uh, for no uh, lack of better term right into the flight deck. Yeah, there's there's a, many things that can go wrong. Several things have gone wrong, but before I get into that. Let's continue with the story of the, the Hornet. Yeah, so the Hornet sinks in October of 1942. And um, so immediately Congress commissions a new aircraft carrier. So mind you, this thing, um, it, it they decide that we're going to build another one. We, we're at war. We've got to have one. And so usually an aircraft carrier in today's society takes um, between six and ten years to build okay. um, from, you know, start to from the commission to the p- point yeah, that it's actually working and out in, in floating fortresses or. OK, so basically the it, it was sunk in October of 1942. OK, the CB8 USS Hornet. And then in um, so they there was already an another aircraft carrier um, that they had plans for and immediately they automatically begin building that. Okay. They started it in 1942. And in 14 months, they had built an, an aircraft carrier. Now, mind you, in today's society, you build an aircraft carrier, it takes six to 10 years right. to build it. But they built CV-12, the USS Hornet, the replacement for the one that had sunk. They built that in 14 months. That is incredible. That doesn't even seem possible. No. If you tell me, if a house takes four months to build and you tell me you're going to build a house in three days, it, it, it's, it sounds it's, impossible. It really is. But what was amazing about it and what, one of the most interesting facts of, of the new USS Hornet, the CV-12, is that almost it was almost entirely built by women. What? Yes, because you have to think. Uh, it was in the middle of the war. Oh, so they're all deployed. They're all dra- deployed. So there's and a draft, too. That's so, exactly oh it. Goodness. So all the men are gone fighting. The ones that are there are conducting, you know, they're they're like a water commissioner or something like that. So they're they're heavily involved in running the country. They're going to be bragging about that forever. That's exactly we it. Did it <laughs> that we did it way faster you than guys you guys seven did. Seven to ten years. That's it. So the, the women, which they called Rosie the Riveters, those, they mainly built CV-12. Wow. So it was almost, it was like 90 something percent built by women. That is incredible. Yeah, they did it in 14 months. And uh, so they automatically, they, they send it out into the waters, put it back. And um, immediately it gets involved in all kinds of battles. So um, it's, it's now going and at this point still has a straight deck and it's, it's launching all of these fighters and it, it gets involved. In fact, they say that CV-12 total, this is not just in World War II, um, but total, it destroyed 1,410 one, uh, 1, enemy aircraft. Wow. Yeah. It, the planes from, from this, this aircraft carrier. They also said that this aircraft carrier destroyed 1 million 269,000 tons of enemy ships. That's amazing. It is amazing. And so one um, ship, one ship um, was, was that influential. So it was very influential in the liberation of the Philippines. Um, It, uh, well, another interesting fact is in June, in fact, June 5th of 1944. So you have to consider what happened on June 6th of 1944. Which was? Which was D-Day. Oh, right. Okay, so D-Day is going on on the Europe, the European front. Right. And while it's going on, there's also a fight going on in the Pacific. And in the Pacific, which is where the USS Hornet CV-12 was located, it's there and it is fighting. And all of a sudden it begins to hear that there's a typhoon or, you know, basically a hurricane. Mm-hmm. 
a typhoon that is um, a class five typhoon that is coming directly towards it. And for some reason, instead of the commanding officer um, who was in charge, not just of those ships, but over the Navy, told them they could not leave the battle. They had to stay. They had to stay there, even though they oh, were going to. So they end up going right through the middle of this typhoon. And the typhoon is just um, they, they say that tens of feet of the waves and it was just it was huge. And so um, not only is it going through this this incredible typhoon, but all of a sudden a massive wave on June 5th, 1944, a massive wave hits the top of this aircraft carrier. The top of it. Oh, you have to consider that these yeah. things are like eight stories off the water. Right. right. It hits the top. A wa- one wave hits the top flight deck and collapses twenty five feet of CV 12s flight deck. Wow. And it was such an intense battle that even though twenty five feet of the runway was missing, mm-hmm. they. St- launched planes. Oh they kept launching planes. That's how intense the battle was. And so, um, Couldn't afford not to have that thing. Yeah. So they end up, um, going back. Um, they go backwards a- after some time to get the, the deck repaired in just a matter of like 60 days. It was completely redone again. They sent it back into battle. And by this it time, those women again, there, there you go. But by this time, the, the war is, is seemingly getting close to over. Um, and so it does participate in several more battles, but eventually, um, it, it transitions to become a troop transport to get them out of the war theater. And so it was used primarily um, towards the end of the war to go into these different places, Guadalcanal, the yeah, Solomon recover. Islands. And it was recovering all of these soldiers and bringing them back to Pearl Harbor, dropping them off and then going and getting more. And so um, thousands upon thousands of men were brought back to the States after the war because of the USS Hornet. So um, remember, it still has a straight flight deck. Right. And so, um, by this time, jet engines for airplanes are beginning to make their way in. Um, they, and so yeah, these are heavier and they need more runway. Yes. And so, um, in 1950, they took it and decided that they were going to completely reconfigure it. So this is after the war. This is after the war. And it's right actually before the beginning of the conflict with in the, uh, the Korean war. Mm-hmm. And so they completely reconfigure it instead of it having a straight runway, it has a V shaped runway so they could both be taking off and landing at the same time. Right. Yeah. So I did research this a little bit. So the, the short runway is operated by or assisted by a catapult and that catapult is powered by steam and the steam is generated from a nuclear reactor. So they have, now they're making them with nuclear reactors, the nuclear reactors generate steam and then the steam powers these. So the steam basically powers it. It's powering a, a um, like a, the, a device that thro- it basically throws the plane into the air. Is that what? Yeah. You- so in, so these things, the, these nuclear reactors generate steam and then this, these boats are essentially steam powered. But it's nuclear reactors that create the steam and the, the nuclear reactors create the steam to drive the boat. And they also create the steam for the catapults. OK, there is one aircraft carrier that I know of today that uses electromagnets to produce, to power the, the catapult. The catapult is only 325 feet long. Wow. So these planes have to go from zero to 176 miles per hour in 1.6 seconds. Wow. What a rush. You talk about a, a roller coaster. And they're running full afterburner as well when, when they're launched. So as soon as they're let go, as soon as the, the wheels are off the deck, and that catapult releases the the crash bar. It's up to the pilot to to get his wits about him, grab onto the stick, and and ascend. Okay, so I, I've got a question on that. There's more on the USS Hornet that that I I'll I'll mention. But before we go there, how does I mean how such a 
short runway and all that. There's got to be a million people on deck that are that are helping. I'm sorry, I exaggerated there, a little bit, but there's got to be a ton of people on deck that yes. are that so are. There's always there's between two and three hundred people on deck, and it is pretty chaotic. So, because there's so many people on deck, they all wear different color uniforms to plainly state what their job is. They got uh, these people that wear yellow uniforms, and the people that wear yellow uniforms are escorts for the plane. They get to tell the plane where to go. Okay, these guys. There's first there. You got to remember, they're all 18, 19, 20 years old. The average age on an aircraft carrier is 21 and a half years old. Wow. And there's 6,000 of them on one aircraft carrier. <sighs> so it takes about two to 300 to be on the flight deck. They all wear different color uniforms. There's people in brown shirts. The brown shirts are the, the plane captains. Okay. They're the ones that talk to the pilot right before he takes off and then debrief the pilot after he lands. And every time he lands, they kind of give him a grading. Like, hey, this is how you did your angle attack was this you had to make this there any corrections we're going to give you an a it's not an a but they, they have these these terminologies they give them and they grade them on their landing okay very rarely is it a perfect landing they might get a perfect landing towards the end of their career but there's always several corrections made and sometimes they get a perfect landing always ways to always a way to improve of some sort okay another so. interesting thing about landing is it takes about one in ten times, there's the, the landing is not successful at the pilot's fault. Okay. So they have like a ninety-five percent land rate, and they practice this all the time. So anyway, the brown shirts are the the captains. They talk to the pilots before they take off and before they land. They make sure everything's in order with the plane. The pilot is, the pilot is, is responsible for making sure his flaps are in fully working order, making sure his engines are working properly. But he has to listen. He has to be directed by these people in yellow shirts. The yellow shirts are the the plane cap, not plane captains. They're the flight deck captains. So they get to tell the plane where to go. These guys don't walk around, but there's so many of them positioned in different places. They have these hand signals. Only 10% of the people on the flight deck have radios. Everyone else operates via hand signals. Wow. So they'll, they'll tap on their chest, for example, to say, hey, pilot pay attention to me and then he'll direct them where to go and then they'll tap their helmet which means hey look at the next guy he's got you now you're in his hands which would would make even better sense as to why they are so extremely um strong on making sure that pilots have great eyesight it, it wouldn't just be because they got to land on the deck and all of this but just the fact of you have to see signals and yeah. all of that. Yeah, so many signals are, you know, signals are not via radio. And I'm sure there's other reasons for that, but you don't want other people listening in on your radio traffic, right? Yes. So you have to be able to, to see it with the naked eye. And then there's blue shirts, which are the people that operate the elevator, the okay. elevator from the the, air, the, the hangar, hangar okay. up to the flight deck. And then they also are assistants to everybody in, in the yellow shirts. And then red shirt people are the people that handle all the ordnance. They are responsible for arming and disarming the planes as they they come and go or the jet as they, they come and go okay purple shirts handle the fuel and then the white shirts are the medical guys so it's all the pilot when he's in his plane he gets to see the colored shirts he knows what their job is he sees the white shirts oh that's medical guy so it's almost I'm a, looking for my yellow guy it's basically like a choreographed dance basically with all of these guys and their different colors i mean they are all doing a specific job at a specific time and they're launching these planes it that it's it has got to be absolute um, pandemonium, but yet organized chaos. Yeah, it is definitely organized chaos. They can launch a plane when they're running their drills. They will launch a plane every 30 seconds. But there's so many things that they have to go through for every, there's like these pre-flight checks. And the, the hand signals are very important. If the pilot shakes his head no, that means something's not right. When he, when he um, uses his... Stick or does the or stick to, to to pan out to the full left and full mm -hmm. right? The flaps aren't moving properly. He'll shake his head no, and that means hey abort. And then as soon as one of the people in the yellow shirt or brown shirt sees him shake his head no, they'll drop to one knee, and that means everybody dropped to one knee. We're aborting. Mm. So that's the signal. Anybody in this chain, the blue shirts, red shirts, white shirts, if anybody drops to one knee, that means abort at this catapult. There's four catapults typically. Okay. And if they're on number one, two, three, or four, someone drops to a knee, everyone at that catapult will drop to a knee and they abort. Oh, got it. And then the yellow shirts will direct him to get off the flight deck and he'll be set aside while the next guy launches. So um, that that's the flight deck. There's, I know there's several different other levels and stuff yeah, like that. So you say there's 6,000 people on there. I mean, do these places have like 
bakeries? Do they have stores? Yeah, like they, have, they, they have barber shops. They have stores. They have gyms. They are basically floating cities. They are U.S. sovereign territory. They are 1,100 feet long, typically 250 feet wide. They are enormous. The flight deck is 60 feet above the water. So if you fall off, there's a good chance you're going to be knocked unconscious. That's why they wear these special, they all wear these special life vests that are activated by salt water. Because if they fall, you're going to get knocked, you're out. knocked out. You're not, yeah. going to be, you're not going to be awake to, to activate your life jacket. So real quick about aircraft carriers in general, they're also used as a, a show of force or to tell other people, hey, you need to calm down. It's a war tactic called escalation dominance. Mm-hmm. So escalation dominance means, hey, if you act up, we're going to blow you to nothing. And we have the power to do it because we have 11 aircraft carriers. Uh, Bill Clinton is quoted saying, the first question I ask when something is going down is, where's the nearest aircraft carrier? Mm. Now, that's probably legitimate because they're one of the most powerful single assets a military has and the most valuable single asset a military has. That is declassified. Yes. I mean, when you think about that one ship, you have the cost of the ship, which is in the billions. Billions, You yes. have the the, the aircraft to on. 6,000 people on board. Yes, which would be the most important, obviously. But as far as equipment, then you have then you have... You know, what do these things have? 70, 70 airplanes on them? Yeah, I, they, they, they'll have 70 to 100 airplanes on them. Most and, of them are, are F-18 Super Hornets. And what do those cost per per airplane? I mean, you're talking 30 million? I, I really don't know. I'm just yeah, guessing. They're, no, it's all very expensive. But aside from that, you got the five to 6,000 young men on there serving our country. Yes, so which it, is, it is the most important thing, and and uh, shout out to all of the the troops and and uh, that are out there today, sacrificing, we, we, not being with their families, risking their lives. Yes, we it we so much appreciate what you honorable. do. I just just real quick going back to the USS Hornet, just thinking about that because um, talking about sacrifice, you know, in in modern days, um, they uh, an aircraft carrier will will go out basically on six month missions mm-hmm. is kind of the basic idea. Um, they come back to port and, but in uh, the USS Hornet, it was out. Um, it, it was launched, you know, in, uh, in 1943. And it was other than the one time where it was brought to repair the, the flight deck, it was out to sea for 18 months straight. These men, um, which actually the USS Hornet has of all of U.S. ships, it has the highest suicide rate. And the reason for that is because it was at sea 18 months. In that 18 months, they would get mail, but they were not allowed to really respond. So you would get you would get a man. Yeah, you get a man that would get a letter that basically it was a dear John letter. You know, hey, uh, you're you're, you know, uh, I've moved on with my life and he would have no way to fix his marriage or his, you know, talk to his girlfriend. At this time, it's important to remember that there was a draft. So these aren't volunteers. That's exactly right. And so the only course of action that they felt was that they obviously we recognize that's not the way to go, but they felt like they had to commit suicide. So it has the highest rate of suicide um, of any uh, naval ship in in history, and um, but yeah, it was out to sea for eighteen months. What a sacrifice! What an, uh, and and just on, as a caveat on top on top of that, um, this so CV twelve the new USS Hornet was attacked fifty nine times from aircraft. 59 times and it this came one did not sink and it was never hit wow never 50, hit never hit oh my it, goodness yeah, 59 times and it was never hit that's so, incredible um, but um so one last thing um okay on on the uss hornet um so it did not participate in the korean conflict um, it because it was undergoing this new configuration for a runway. And so it finally gets the new configuration and then Vietnam hits. When Vietnam hits, it 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 goes to the battlefront and it is there launching planes day and night for years um, to help 
um, in the Vietnam War. And so in the middle of that, in the year 1969, mind you, um, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy, uh, I believe it was actually 61 or 62, he had stated that by the end of this decade, we want to put a man on the moon. And so, um, you know, America really began doing that, even though it was in the middle of a war with Vietnam uh, for most of that time. It was still really trying to put a man on the moon. So in 1969, the USS Hornet has been in Vietnam for uh, several um, several years, actually. And it finally is released to return back to base to restock get, you know, its crew kind of take a little time off and then it would be, it would head back into the battlefront. But as it is released, the Admiral says, actually, just kidding. You're not released. Instead of being in the battle, yep. instead of being in the battle, you are now going to be the recovering ship for the astronauts of Apollo 11. Oh, wow. So it was positioned perfectly that the capsule that was landing in the ocean from Apollo 11, that this ship was positioned almost perfectly to pick up those astronauts. So they end up putting this this um, capsule, not, not the space capsule, but this um, quarantine capsule mm-hmm. on the hangar deck. And so it, the, when the Apollo 11 astronauts land, they pick them up and put them on this the carrier, this USS yeah. Hornet. And so it was the first steps that these three astronauts had taken back on Earth. They go and they That's were quarantined awesome. on the on the USS Hornet for two weeks, and that is actually where President. Um, I believe it was President Nixon by this time. Mm -hmm. President Nixon uh, actually helicoptered out to the USS Hornet and greeted these men for the first time. That's awesome. So not only did it participate in multiple, all these battles. All these battles. Doesn't get sunk the second time. It's it's commissioned. Exactly. And then ends up, and not only did it pick up the Apollo 11 astronauts, but it was in the same vicinity. Um, So that was July of 1969. And then again in October of 1969, it picked up the Apollo 12 astronauts as well. So it, it has a great history, not only in battles, not only uh, in in war, but it has a, a very unique history with the space program as well. That's awesome. Well, speaking of astronauts, there's one other thing that's a testament to how how nerve wracking it is to be a fighter pilot taking off and landing on one of these aircraft carriers, and that is an astronaut joins the military. He joins the navy and he becomes a fighter pilot, and he's assigned to the to one of the aircraft carriers. And he describes landing at night more stressful than it was landing on the moon. Wow. So he landed on the moon. He lands on the moon, walks on the moon, whatever he does, right? But he says it's more stressful to land on an aircraft carrier at night than it is to land on the moon. Just the pitching and the moving and the darkness. There's all and these just variables all, going and on. And you still got to catch the third wire and, and all yeah, of this. Have, that's right. They have to use a hook they can't see to catch a wire they can't see. And all at full speed because don't they have to uh, set yes. their, their afterburners so, on... So afterburner and full throttle are basically the same thing. So they have to hit that wire at first they have to coast down, right? They have to put their flaps down, put the hook down and get their angle of attack right and rate of descent right. Once they get everything lined up, they approach the deck and as soon as they touch, they have to go full throttle or afterburner. Because Because if they miss the wire, they have to be able to take off. Wow. So if so they, they miss that they need, wire, they need they've the momentum got the momentum from, to go again. They need the momentum from their, their rate of descent and their speed, current speed along with full throttle in order to make it back up into the air. Well, I, I think... If they miss the wire. Wow. So after they catch the wire, they have to leave it full throttle until they're told to throttle down. If they throttle down before they're told to throttle down, you get a very bad mark on you. It's almost amazing. It, it's it's amazing that there's not more like cushions or something because the jerk of that, um, like pulling you back to stop you, has to be an extraordinary force. Yeah. It, well, the launching they don't they don't hold on to the, to the stick when they're launched. They hold on to a towel rack or they put their hands on their lap because it is so forceful. It will. 
it will cause them to to pull up when they too soon and they need to get a little more speed before they're able to pull away from the water so, so they have to trust the plane to, wow. to for the flaps to go straight and for the computer to do its thing before they take a hold of the stick and pull out well they call it rolling out i i think um just in discussing this and i know there's a lot more that we could talk about and and, and all of that but i think the one thing that I, that i would say is thank you to these men and women who put their lives on the line to make this happen. It's just, yeah, put it their is lives just on the line, unreal. Spend the, these, these crazy long deployments away from their family, it's a sacrifice and it's, it's, it's very, I mean, it's more stressful than landing on the moon, according the, to the one pilot. So, I mean, that is incredible yes, that if, they're, if they're willing you, to do this for their country. That you're willing to go through that kind of stress, like you said, that's more stressful than landing on the moon and you're willing to do this day in and day out um, just is a, is another reason why I, I think I think the good Lord that we live in the good old US of A and the great country that we have and to all of you sailors and airmen out there who put your lives on the line well uh, all we branches fully support, of military. yes we fully support you 100%. All right, well, that's it for this episode. It was a lot of fun talking about aircraft carriers. Let us know what you think. Uh, We also got our our new uh, intro music, so we're pretty excited about that. So join us again next time. Next week, we will be talking about something new. Not sure what it's going to be yet, but we'll take your suggestions. We're thinking about energy drinks, but we don't know yet. It might be different, so don't quote me on that. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. We will see you later. 